UW360 is proudly supported by Pacific Office Automation, Copy, Print, Workflow, and IT, Problem Solved. BECU, a not-for-profit, member-owned credit union. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Welcome to UW360 from stunning Odegaard Library, newly renovated and home to some incredible new learning and technology spaces, including a new writing and research center, technology studio, beautiful atrium, and just tons of great new space for students and staff alike to study and work. We'll get a closer look at this award-winning renovation a little later in the show. We'll also learn more about the University of Washington's role in the world's largest ever study of Alzheimer's disease and see how the results could lead to a treatment, maybe even a cure, for the dreaded disease. We'll go behind the scenes of the talented UW volleyball team to learn the secret of this championship team's success and see how the UW is changing the face of the field of engineering. But first, Governor Jay Inslee and UW President Michael Young have a lot to celebrate these days. The state of Washington is leading the way in clean energy, and the University of Washington is playing a critical role. UW's Clean Energy Institute is developing efficient, cost-effective solar power and better energy storage systems. And all of this became possible when our governor and state legislators allocated $6 million to create the research center. Now the best and brightest are coming here to the Northwest to assist in the next big breakthroughs in clean energy. Oh, this is great. Having Governor Jay Inslee here was just an, an amazing boost to the event. It's good to go, we're good to go here. Uh, this is a, a dream come true for me and it is a huge delight to be here. This historic event is the launch of UW's Clean Energy Institute. I am absolutely uh, overjoyed to be joining with you to the start of the Clean Energy Institute. A $6 million allocation from Governor Jay Inslee and the state legislature has made this all possible. This clean energy research will have a profound effect on the university, our state, and even beyond our borders. And now the future of clean energy, not just for the state of Washington, but for the world, can come right out of the University of Washington. Energy is huge. Right now, Washington State actually is a global leader in clean energy. The Clean Energy Institute is advancing research in solar and energy storage technologies. This is the, the, uh, the notion that... To get a glimpse, we tagged along on a tour with Governor Inslee. Clean energy is truly a grand challenge up there with global health, with clean water. Clean energy is what society, is society needs. Well, there's really data there. Daniel Schwartz is the director of the Clean Energy Institute. As a state, we produce between hydro, wind, solar, we produce, uh, I think the recent numbers are 29% of the nation's clean energy. Governor Jay Inslee has been a national leader in clean energy, climate uh, policies that would, will drive the whole country in a positive direction. So it's converting it to electricity, going through this circuit. The goal is to make solar energy less expensive and more accessible for everyday life. Because the sunlight is ubiquitous. You know, it, it is truly everywhere. Plastic materials can harvest sunlight and they can be then, because they're flexible, they can be integrated into things like your shoulder bag so that you can charge your cell phone in your shoulder bag. We have batteries that are being developed uh, that let us more efficiently and cost effectively store the energy that's being harvested everywhere uh, from the sun. Demonstrations by graduate students shine a light on some of this innovative technology. The Clean Energy Institute, of course, is bringing talent from all over the country and the world to the University of Washington to work in these areas. But many of those students stay here, creating companies, jobs, and employment. Creating clean energy, more jobs, and preserving our planet means a brighter future 
for all of us. Clean energy is truly the solution to climate change. For more information about the University of Washington's Clean Energy Institute, you'll find a link on our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. When we come back, a look at the UW's role in the world's largest study of Alzheimer's disease and what the results of that study could mean for patients today as UW360 continues. Welcome back to UW360. It was a monumental effort. Scientists and researchers from the University of Washington recently took part in the world's largest ever study of Alzheimer's disease, involving 74,000 subjects in 15 countries. Thanks in part to the work done by the UW, that study made significant strides towards identifying a more effective treatment, perhaps even eventually a cure for the disease. But will this happen in time to help patients today? Bob Brana meets with a leading authority on Alzheimer's and a local couple dealing with a disease to answer that agonizing question. Tuna sandwiches for lunch? Sure, sure. John Barnard takes pride in his cooking. Cheese needs... Uh, cutting. Cutting. Making a mess. And on this day at their waterfront home near Port Ludlow, he's preparing lunch for his wife of more than 30 years, Gail Crawford, and her 92-year-old mother, Fran. John earns extra points by washing the dishes and putting them away, too. But some time ago, that gratitude turned to worry for Gail. Because he does the dishes, pretty much, and I would just find things in places they didn't belong. At her urging, John agreed to undergo testing for Alzheimer's disease at the University of Washington. At first he passed the test, but over time his memory worsened and so did his test scores. Now, ten years later, his doctors say he is exhibiting the classic symptoms of Alzheimer's. John's reaction? About equal parts concern and defiance. I wasn't devastated by the news. But you weren't accepting But I it. wasn't accepting particularly of it either. And uh, I'd say I still have a degree of that. It's pretty hard. Yeah to accept that you don't remember things, and especially when he doesn't remember things, he doesn't remember he doesn't remember things. Yeah. <laughs> well, that could be a pretty rock. We'll just deal with it as it comes, but it's really hard, I think, for anybody to see, lose their loved one inch by inch, and that's what happens to you, you know? The person that, um, you fell in love with and uh, married and shared your life with, you know, become, become somebody else. And because John has always been very intellectual and I always enjoyed that, um, you know, and it's just harder for, for him now to keep up with things, so. You know, so I, you know, I miss out. I miss, I miss who he was. Alzheimer's may be the best known disease about which so little is known. Effective treatments remain elusive, there is no cure. But in part, thanks to the University of Washington, that may be about to change. Several university scientists and their research teams recently participated in the largest international study ever conducted on Alzheimer's, involving 74,000 subjects in 15 countries. One of the study participants is Dr. Debbie Swan, a professor in UW Medicine's Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. I am a geriatric psychiatrist. So I have been studying Alzheimer's disease, um, especially the clinical aspects in treating patients with Alzheimer's disease. A major difficulty in diagnosing Alzheimer's is finding the genetic roadmap to the disease. With the university's help, the study found 11 new genes in the human brain associated with Alzheimer's. That's more than twice the number of previously identified genes. That's considered a major advance since the new discovery could lead to the underlying causes of the disease and therefore to better treatment, or perhaps someday, a cure. And some of the genes that are um, possibly involved make a lot of sense as far as neuro uh, the neurobiology of Alzheimer's disease. Some of the uh, primary findings in genetics of Alzheimer's disease came out of the UW. Dr. Thomas Bird is a professor of neurology and medical genetics with UW Medicine. He's a leading authority on Alzheimer's and says the international study is a big step forward. I think it's important 
uh, because it adds information to our thinking about both the genetics of Alzheimer's disease and what we call the pathogenesis of the disease, how, you know, how is it developing in the brain. He's not surprised the University of Washington was asked to participate in the study. It traditionally has been one of the leading centers for the study of Alzheimer's and dementia. John Barnard and Gail Crawford agree. Very, very impressive. That's why we like being a part of it, because we are impressed with what they're doing. Still, any new treatment or cure may arrive too late for John, who's 77 years old. Dr. Swan says those likely to benefit will be early onset victims of Alzheimer's, people in their 40s, 50s, and early 60s. I'm not looking forward to a solution this week, you know, or this month, or even in my lifetime. But if my participation has helped, learn some of those things, then fine. That's what it was all about. For John and Gail, there is more to coping with Alzheimer's than clinical tests or international studies. Now you do have to have a sense of humor. Isn't that what life's all about, for goodness sake? I don't think anybody goes through it unscathed by something, you know. But it's a whole lot better when you have a partner. And, uh, you know, it's just, you need the support sometimes. And uh, I couldn't do half of what I do without her. Now to a story about a sports dynasty here on campus that just gets stronger every season. We're talking about the championship University of Washington volleyball team, a club that uses every day to grow. And this past season was no exception. Just ask head coach Jim McLaughlin. Our Aaron Mayofsky found his winning formula is simply hard work on and off the court. Volleyball. The game never ends for coach Jim McLaughlin, just coming off a stellar season. The magic comes in making sure that what you're doing on this day are the right things that you need to work on. The 13-year coach is already working on putting together another run at a national championship. You know, recruiting is such that we're already so many years down the road and you're constantly recruiting, you never stop recruiting. <laughs> For the 11th straight year, McLaughlin led the Huskies to the NCAA Tournament. This past season, the Dogs took it all the way to the Final Four. It's like a dream come true, having it right here at home, where we can see her and all her friends and family can cheer all of them on. It's very exciting. Nagaris looking for Van Sant, gets it down for the kill, and look at the emotion early on. I think it's win the serve, serve, receive, and when we get an opportunity, we got to make them pay, and we haven't done that. Only to lose a heartbreaker to Penn State in front of the home fans here at Key Arena. And it's over. Penn State will play for a record-tying sixth national championship Saturday night against Wisconsin. I looked at the pain on their face. It was, it's very deep, but I love them. I mean, it's wonderful being around them, and... Uh, you know, I'll miss the seniors for sure, but I can't wait to get back in the gym with the, the returners. Nearly a dozen dogs will be back on the roster this fall, including outside hitter Krista Van Sant, whose credentials run deep, being named the Pac-12, the AVCA, and the Honda Player of the Year. Back out to Van Sant. Yeah. Now that we've been there, it's kind of a good experience to have, and I think that we will learn from that. We're not there to just make it to the national championship. We're there to win, and it's already in our minds. First workout back from break. My name is Jenna Orlandini, and I'm from La Cañada, California. The Huskies will be saying goodbye to four players, but not before an incredible career that made everybody proud, despite an emotional ending. We got to the Final Four. We won a Pac-12 championship, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's not what we wanted, but I think down the road, I'll kind of look back on it and be like, you know, we did something together. We did something special. Um, it might not have turned out how we wanted, but you know, it's, it was the journey that made it worth all of it. The way I've always evaluated success is, you know, how did they feel when they left here, and were they set up for something else? Um, and for the most part, you know, I think we've had a good experience with that, and we've been very successful, not just on the court but off the court. 
With the Huskies averaging over 25 wins a season since Coach McLaughlin took over the program and a 2005 national championship in their pocket, getting to volleyball's version of the big dance is a given. Now it's about dealing with the pressure of being a perennial powerhouse. You know, I believe and they believe we're Washington. You know, why not us? Why can't we, you know, win it? Why can't we become the best team in the country? The Huskies 2014 season kicks off in late summer. Just before that, in July, Coach McLaughlin holds his annual volleyball youth camp right here on campus. When we come back, see how the UW is working to change the face of engineering as UW 360 continues. Welcome back to UW 360 at beautiful Odegaard Library. Engineering has long been a male-dominated field, but the University of Washington has been on a two-decade mission to close the gender gap in both enrollment and faculty. Mimi Gann shows us how the university is succeeding and inspiring a whole new generation of female engineers. Men have long dominated the engineering profession, but here at the University of Washington, a group of women is trying to change all that. Um, so my research is trying to make mobile video communication more accessible, specifically to deaf and hard of hearing people. Jessica Tran is pursuing a PhD in electrical engineering at the University of Washington. She's one of the few females in the department. When I tell people that I'm an electrical engineer, I do sometimes get a surprised reaction because I think today people still have the stereotype of what an engineer may look like. This is um, an example, a sample of our classes. The College of Engineering has been on a mission to close the gender gap in both enrollment and faculty, and it's working. In engineering, college enrollments of women are around 19% female, and it's been flat for years. Our College of Engineering has 21% women faculty, um, and the national average is 14%. So we are 50% higher than the national average, and we're really proud of that. I think we're a leader in um women in science and engineering faculty for a variety of different reasons and one of them I think is that the environment that faculty find themselves here is very supportive and it's nurturing and there is a cadre of people that you can talk to. So why in our tech savvy society are so few females seeking careers in engineering? Professor Eve Riskin thinks the reasons are still due to social pressures and misconceptions. I think very much it starts in middle school where you see girls losing interest in math why they're doing that, it's not clear. Is it because society is telling girls that it's not cool to be good at math? I think many people have a misconception of what engineers do. They might think of Dilbert, but in reality, engineers work in teams of people, um, diverse teams of people. They travel, they communicate. We covered a lot of topics. Dr. Joyce Yen says having engineers from different backgrounds and genders is not only the right thing to do, but the smart thing to do. There's all kinds of research out there now that shows that diverse groups are more innovative, they find more creative and better solutions to problems. For example, if women had input on designing the very first airbag, it might not have failed. So the first generation of the airbag was designed by mostly men, and then when um, smaller women or children were put in front of the airbags, they were injured or killed. So that's, that's a great reason why you would have liked to have had women on the team. To retain and increase the number of female faculty in engineering, the UW offers professional development workshops and mentoring opportunities. These are places where you get to figure out how to be your best professional self. I'm Michaela, and I'm a sophomore applying for electrical engineering. Another good reason to have more female faculty? To inspire the next generation of female engineers. Professor Eve Riskin has really been a key influence in for me to pursue my engineering degree, especially a PhD. Our new dean likes to joke that when we're 51% women, faculty will stop. But actually, that's not my ultimate goal. My ultimate goal would be when Joyce and I are out of business, when you know it doesn't really matter what gender the new faculty are. It doesn't really matter what gender the students are. In the meantime, for female engineering students and faculty, there's no better place than the University of Washington. Here at the University of Washington, we like to say, if you want to save a person, be a doctor. 
If you want to save the world, be an engineer. The faculty here at the School of Engineering is always trying to come up with innovative ways to support women and minority engineering students. And they say their doors are always open for young women who want to learn more about the field. I'm Mimi Gann. Straight ahead, we take a tour of beautifully renovated Odegaard Library and see why this place has become one of the best places to study and work on campus as UW 360 continues. Welcome back, everyone. Odegaard Undergraduate Library opened its doors this last September for the first time after a $16.5 million renovation. With all kinds of new equipment, Odegaard is now easily one of the most flexible and beautiful learning environments on campus. And as Austin Seedentop reports, students have taken this place to heart and really made it their own. Students come to Odegaard Undergraduate Library for all sorts of reasons and Odegaard does everything it can to keep up with demand. Well, I forgot my laptop at home, so I needed a computer uh, very badly. I am writing on this wall to help me study for my final today. Um, I'm printing a paper. I, I like the atmosphere a lot. It's pretty relaxed, but there's still a bit of energy. Also, all the new uh, revisions uh, to the actual place are quite nice. I think it makes it a more inviting space for students to come and study and get work done. I would definitely say Odegaard belongs to the students. It is their office away from home. They have feel great ownership of the space and we are learning from them every day on what works for students. How, what do they need today when they're doing their work? Just this last September, Odegaard Undergraduate Library opened its doors to a fresh flood of students after a $16.5 million renovation. And now, after a full academic quarter, students have had time to explore all of the new features and make it their home. The renovation adds a lot. All sorts of new equipment like computers, screens, and writable surfaces are available for use. Glass panels installed on the third floor create a quiet study space. And the staircases have been moved to the side of the building, opening up the vast atrium to natural daylight pouring in from the new skylight. The effect is a refreshing open Odegaard. We heard comments about Odegaard before that it was dark, that the brown, the overwhelming brown and darkness, not enough outlets, um, didn't make it uh, a favorite place to study on campus. I never thought I would hear people as they walk into Odegaard say, it's so beautiful. And they do, and I think they do that because of the skylight, I think because of the grays and the whites and bringing in light. The students have done so much to make this space their own. I mean, just uh, something as small as moving chairs from one space to another so that they have, you know, the appropriate collaborative space that they need. A renovated Odegaard is a flexible Odegaard. And a great example of that is how students treated these chairs. Originally, they were set up in groups of two to three, but the first thing students did when they got here was take the chairs and drag them over to these benches. They'd kick their feet up and stay here to study for a couple of hours. It really goes to show that you can prepare for what you think students are going to want, but only a student can show you what they really need. 请问, 请问 is to add, going to bring up a question. Another amazing addition to the library are two brand new active learning classrooms. These classrooms have completely uprooted the traditional format of a college class. Just see what it does for a Chinese 101 class. The students sitting around from each other has given us the ability to really interact with each other. My favorite part about the Odegaard active learning classrooms is probably the glass boards. Um, you can write on them just as they are whiteboards and be able to um, write out characters and use them as you learn. The equipment at the podium enables me to uh, project students' uh, uh, discussion results and I think most students enjoy that. They like to contribute to the class instead of just sitting there passively receiving so-called knowledge. I wanted to flip the class 
I wanted to be uh, having students engage much more often. Odegaard's renovation has made it a one-stop shop for anything an undergraduate might need for class. If you're a student, that means Odegaard is brand new and here for you. And technically that means it's here for me too. And I have an essay that I need to prep for, so I'll see you next time. I'm Austin Seedenthal. If you'd like to learn the library's hours of operation, you'll find a link on our website. And you can also find more information about any of the stories you saw on today's show on our website, uwtv.org slash uw360. And that does it for this edition of UW360. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time with all new stories from the University of Washington.